everybody, and welcome back to The War Room, part of the Clone Star podcast. I am your host, Joe Hurley, and this week I'm joined by my regular co-host, Mike Overton. Mike, how are you today? I'm good, thank you, Joe. Except for that massive headache that you told me you had before we yes, started recording. <laughs> and this week, we are joined by a man that you may know uh, from various appearances in Star Trek in the next generation, Voyager, three times on DS9, and a hefty seven times as the Suleiman Silic in Enterprise. And he was also regular on Carnival as Gecko. And he has a list of movie and a TV appearances that are way too long to even mention. So this week, we are delighted to be joined by the critically acclaimed actor and performance artist, John Fleck. John, how are you? I miss my voice. I can't talk. <laughs> no, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> John, I, 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 I was going through your bio and there was something that immediately jumped out and I said, I have to start the interview and ask him this because if I don't, I'll be very disappointed. In your bio on the website, it says, an actor since 1976, he gained notoriety as a performance artist in 1983 when he climbed on top of the one-way bar in Silver Lake at a monthly event called Theoretical and proceeded to strip tease while singing Pacini's Madam Butterfly. Uh, you seem to be hiding your face there, John. Now, this is your life, so I'm very curious. How does one strip tease while singing Pacini's Madam Butterfly? And did you do it well? Here, I'll show you right now. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the one of those banners that says too hot for TV on it. When we're editing it comes to put black bars over bits, yeah. Oh, you know, well, you know, I came out here to be an actor and, you know, I did. Uh, I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, uh, like in the mid 70s. And then I got out and then, you know, you start auditioning for a little theater. And, you know, I, I, I survived by typing. I could type 120 words a minute. So but anyways, I, I used to hang out at these clubs in Hollywood and Silver Lake, which is right by Hollywood here in L.A., and uh, they were kind of punk clubs, and I started getting in with the performance art crowd. And uh, and so I was asked by the guy that held these monthly events at this one way, which was like, God, how would you describe it? Like, God, like a almost like a an S and M leather punk bar, primarily gay, but these events were very kind of you know mixed men women, but but everybody was loaded with tattoos. This was before anybody had tattoos, and these people were all tattooed and piercings and the hair up to here, and woo, it was you know uh, kind of crazy. So he asked me to open for uh, Edie Massey. I don't know if you know Edie Massey. She was the egg lady in John Waters' uh, Pink Flamingos. I think um, she was in a lot of his. Anyway, she was on stage, and he asked me to open for her, and I never. You know, on this oh shit. Let me turn off my phone. Where is it here? Yeah. Oh, surprise, surprise, and scam likely. Um, but uh <laughs> I'll turn that up. So oh, anyway, I, I scam I, I likely always off. makes phone calls at the wrong time. <laughs> yeah, Poor I, scam I'm likely. Scam. Madam Scam. Oh boy. Um, so anyways, I climbed on the bar and I knew I had to kind of wow them because they they if they didn't like you they throw a beer bottle at you you know so it was you know your life in your hands and i i had been training i had like a four octave voice which i still i can still hit the high notes now so i got up there and uh like i mean this is not the highlight of my career here but uh, you know since you asked so i basically you know i got up on stage <laughs> God, everybody's going to turn your podcast off after I tell you this story here. But uh, I, I, I slowly pulled my pants down and I, I sang, there's no penis like show penis and no penis. I know, you know, like everyone's like, what the fuck? Oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. Oh, you're fine, fine. You're fine. Uh, okay. And uh, so, and then, you know, before they, had, <laughs> before they could clutch their beer bottle and throw it at me, I, I started singing, you know, the Madam Butterfly song and all pranced about. Oh, and then I had feathers, I had pink feathers, and I sang the song Flamingo. And, oh, anyways, it was not the best, but hey, they didn't throw a beer bottle at me, and it was it was all uphill or downhill from there. So <laughs> there you have it. Oh, so, my... so wait a second, when you went on stage, had you all this rehearsal? Did you just say, do you know what, I'm just going to do whatever the hell comes to mind? 
Well, I, I had a mind. I knew what I was going to do, you know, but you always have to allow for improv, you know, just in case to dump a beer bottle or something. But uh, uh, no, it was pretty well planned out, but always allowing for the improvisational mode to, to kick in, so to speak. Survival <laughs> mode, as I call it, yes. So going back all the way to the start, like what got you into acting originally? Like, did you grow up in like a creative household? Was there kind of or like, did you just kind of just decide to branch out and do what you wanted to do yourself? You know, there was no uh, nobody was ever an actor or performer. You know, my father was a carpenter guy and my mother was a housewife. You know, she had seven kids, um, you know, Irish Catholic, you know, and German <laughs> father. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think. Anyways, I won't go into their relationship, but uh, no, they're, um, I don't know, you know, we just moved so much, you know, I went to like 10 different schools before I graduated um, from high school, and uh, so I was often, I didn't have a lot of friends, so I, I think I, I kind of got into my imagination, and I, you know, have these little imaginary characters I pretend to be to escape the grim reality of living in that household. Uh, so my my creative imagination was triggered, and then um, and then I went to Europe when I was 20, um, 20 years old. You know, it was during the Vietnam War, and my draft number came up. It was twenty nine, which was pretty assured that I would be drafted. And I was like, oh shit, I I never fired a gun. I just I couldn't do it. So. So I, I hopped on a plane uh, by myself and I, I went to, um, actually I flew into London and then I was there for almost four months, you know, traveling around Europe with my um, your rail pass and my little, you know, youth hostel card. And, uh, and I met so many creative people there and I came back and I, I had a girlfriend at the time and I started to do a little community theater. Anyway, she was coming to Los Angeles in 1974 to go to acting school. And she says, why don't you come audition, you know, and do it. And I never really thought I had tried to take an acting class in college, but I was so terrified, you know, oh God. But anyways, it was my escape from um, Cleveland. And I came out here and went to acting school. And I guess that was um, that was the beginning of it all. Yeah. I would, and when you went to acting school then, like, did you find it easy to come out of your shell? Or were you kind of like, did it take a bit of time for that to kind of develop within you? I think it took a little time, but the, the shell was cracking open, it, 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 you know, if we're going to go with that image. Yeah, uh, my shell was cracking open and I, I realized I did have a, a talent, you know, some talent. And uh, so I just kept taking acting classes after I got out of there, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. And, you know, I studied voice and I studied tap dancing. And, you know, it's funny, even though I had no um, really, excuse me, encouragement you know, or creative background in my family. My father always said, you need to learn to tap dance. So I, you know, I learned how to tap dance I studied for many years. And uh, Wait a yeah. second. Why did your father pick tap dance of absolute, like there's a lot of things he could have picked there. Why <laughs> tap dancing? I have to understand that. <laughs> Well, my mother wanted me to be an accountant, you know, because they were very working class and never had a nickel to their name. So, you know, accountant equals money. And uh, and my dad, I, I would uh, do his books for him, you know, when he was working, you know, just some simple ledgers, you know, coming in, going up. And I do have a talent with with um, bookkeeping and numbers. And thank God I managed to do OK financially in my life. But uh, but anyways, but my dad, um, he was, you know, he was a creative guy. He he, he painted, you know, sometimes and uh, and uh, he liked to, he had a little accordion that he played, you know, when he got drunk. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I don't know why he told me to take tap dancing lessons, but he always did. So um, I guess the tap dancing impressed him. So I, I, you know, I learned to do a nice little you know shuffle off to buffalo um one of my first little gigs here in hollywood you know after i got out of acting class i did the gong show i don't know if you guys ever heard i've of heard of the gong show yeah it was uh, big in the uh, 70s uh, out here and that's actually how i got my screen actors guild card um is i i auditioned uh for uh, the gong show and I did, uh, I, I tap danced and I whistled without moving my lips. See, that was one of my unusual <laughs> talents. This put on my early resume. I could whistle without moving my lips. So I do that. So I, so here, I'll do a little version. <clears throat> So I'm, anyways, I'm doing this little soft shoe and I'm whistling and they're all looking at me like, what the hell? Because, you know, I, 
that was a bad choice for TV because they thought it was a recording, you know, like, okay, he's not moving his lips. Where's the, the sound coming from? They almost gonged me, but they didn't. And uh, I ended up uh, getting like, they used to give you cases of cough syrup, you know, little, I don't know, crazy things, like little gifts. Yeah. And, and, Your and, prize and, this week, a lifetime supply of cough syrup. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, they gave me all kinds of weird things. Soap, and I think there was not maybe not cough syrup. It's in my imagination. But uh, <laughs> hey, but that's how I got my union card. So thank you, Gong Show. Um, so, so when you were oh, my, like, like after you got out of college, then like were you kind of there going, I want to do something in performance arts. I want to do something in theater. I want to be like on TVs, movies. What was the kind of objective at this point? What was my objective at this point? Well, you know, I, I had to stay alive out here. I had driven cross country and, uh, you know, they, my family didn't, didn't give me any money. So I had to survive, you know. So that was my primary thing. But, you know, I just, I hit the ground running. I just knew this was my my calling, so to speak, to to be an actor. And, and, and I'm so thankful I, I managed to, you know, find you know club work and, and the cabaret scene if you will you know that just uh to, to, you know actually i did i was a part of a panel last week at a little university out here cal state university uh, uh for the uh, uh the graduate students the theater students uh, and the panel of performance artists like me and just you know like to, to give kids like okay the options we all want to be creative you know and it's if, if you put all your eggs into this auditioning for TV and film, oh, you're always waiting, waiting, waiting. What can you do to be creative and not always waiting for somebody to give you a job so you can create your own work, you know? And that's what I learned. That's where I started to become a, if you will, a performance artist, you know, back in the oh, early eighties is when I started booming in that regard. Um, anyways, what, well, I forget what, what, what the question was, sorry. <laughs> what, what did you enjoy yeah. about performance arts then? Oh, geez. Well, the freedom, the imagination. I, I, oh, you know, and, you know, I was studying with all these great teachers that really, ooh, encouraged me to improv and, blah, 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 you know, and go on these creative tangents. And I just started creating these little pieces that grew into bigger pieces and uh, into bigger spaces. And, uh, you know, I just, that's when I'm most alive is when I'm being creative, you know, as, so many of us creative folks, you know that you just something's calling us. Why? Why are you doing this podcast? You just I don't know. It's something that we have to do. You know, our creative higher power is leading in this and in, in that path. So and just look at your like IMDb list of all the kind of the credentials that you have in terms of movie and TV appearances. There's so many of them, and they're so kind of different in terms of, say, different characters, different motivations, et cetera, et cetera. Is that what's kind of appealed to you about all these characters? It's there's so many different characters you've played. So that means you're not just sticking to one type. You're constantly going around mm. and doing different things. I often wonder, maybe I, I could have been more focused in terms of my career. I kind of, uh, you know, I kind of... I decided, you know, it, it, after I've been out here for like 10 years doing theater, I, I needed to make some money creatively. So that's when I go, you know, come on, John, let's get an agent. Let's try to do some TV film, you know. And uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, uh, that's what I was doing. And then, you know, these roles would start coming my way. And, uh, you know, I do them, you know, and I, I get cast, you know, and then. Then all these Star Treks happened, started to happen, you know, in the uh, early 90s. It's funny, after the whole NEA4 thing, this controversy thing, uh, uh, we haven't talked about it yet. Uh, but, but you're no. aware, right? Oh, that's one of the questions coming up. This yes. Not, <laughs> yeah, uh, you're, pre, you're preempting my notes, I, John. I, I it's all here. Mind, so I can read your dirty mind. I know what you're thinking. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, okay, so... Anyways, hey, the boy was just trying to make him a living, and, and you know, and I learned, boy, you can make some decent big bucks doing TV stuff. You know, I remember my first lesson in how much money you can make. I was doing a theater piece in the like the mid '80s, and I got cast in this little commercial. Uh, and, and and I told my agent, you know, I can't work on these days because I'm doing the theater. Anyways, they they wanted me to shoot the night of the show, and I said I can't do it. So okay, so. I pass, and then they my agent called back. Okay, they're gonna, uh, you know, 
let's say I was making 750 a day. Okay, then, okay, they'll, they'll give you a, a thousand. I go, I can't do it. They go, okay, then she came back. Okay, they'll give you 2,000. I, can't, I can't do it, I'm, I'm committed. Anyways, the director ended up calling and says, I'll give you $7,500 if you do it. I go, hmm. So I canceled <laughs> so that night and I did it. So, I <laughs> so in other words, you learn to haggle really well. <laughs> I know. Well, the power of no, you know, it's sometimes if you say no, that's when they really want you. Hollywood is so screwy. If, if they can't have you, they, they got to have you, you know. <laughs> and John, if you were to pick then performance, art, theater, movies and TV, which is your favorite? Well, you know, I do love sh shooting film. It's just the opportunities aren't happening as much, even though, you know, um, last year I, I did do a, this very low budget film called Dead Mail, and I, and I had the lead role in it. And, uh, and that was just so rewarding, if not financially, creatively, and to know that I could carry and sustain a movie. And the good news is I, I just um, heard a couple of weeks back that uh, our film is going to be in the South by Southwest Film Festival in Austin, Texas. Uh, so I'm going to fly out there on March um, 8th for four nights and, uh, yeah, see the film. And, you know, I mean, these guys are incredible. They shot this movie, a full-length feature. They wrote it. They shot it. They've got a couple other films under their belt. belt. But I think they did it for, like, $300,000, the entire film, which is nothing, you know. Oh, wow, yeah. And, uh, and the fact that they got into a film festival and, you know, it's, uh, you know. Anyways, uh, in terms of your question, what would I rather do? I, well, obviously I like to do it all, you know, but um, living here in Hollywood, you know, you know, you're only as good as your last job. I, I wish I, 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 I kind of, I have made TV film kind of the, my God, you know, like that's when you really made it. So. I, I'm trying to accept that, hey, you know what? I, 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 I'm a creative person and hey, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a new piece, performance piece and, 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 and hey, that, that's good too. That has value too. You know, it's so easy for me. Oh, if you're not making big bucks in the TV film business, then oh, you're, you're nobody. But I, I'm trying to open it up. I, I have my performance art, I have theater and I have that. So how blessed I, I am. And, and you know, and I don't need the money, right? I, I'm financially solvent and I don't need the health insurance anymore. And so, hey, you know, the world is my oyster if I look at it that way, you know, <laughs> and not get resentful. I'm not working more in the TV business anymore. And what's your creative process, John? As you said, like, you're a very creative kind of guy. Like, if you're approaching, say, be it a role on TV, be it performance, art, or anything like that, what's the kind of approach that you take? Obviously, it's going to vary per project and all that, and then vary per person. But what, what do you think is the way you approach things best? Well, the creative process, you know, for a for an acting role, a traditional TV film or theater role, you know, you read the script. You know, and what where do you fit in with that? What's your relationships with everybody else? And and what 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 am I, what do I need? What do I want? And what what can I do in each scene to engage with my partner? I mean, you know, it's a very kind of active process. I mean, I, I love that discovery. You know, in terms of my own work, I don't know. It's kind of got a bigger scope. Like what? I, I start off with little seeds, like a song or or a, or a phrase, and and I build a God, I, I don't know how to, you know, and it's just you know you plant these seeds and they mm, take root. I, I just did a a one nighter in New York in um, November <clears throat> of this show. I, I discovered this singer uh, Beatrice Lilly. You probably never heard of her, huh? She she was a big uh, the vaudevillian singer back in the day. Anyways, just a magical androgynous figure and she really piqued my imagination. So I did a one night thing called Beatrice Lily, the devil and me. And uh, kind of like uh, the spirit of Beatrice Lily saves me from this, oh, this Bible thumping father. Uh, you know, a lot of my work, you know, it, it seems autobiographical, but I always say, why let the truth stand, <laughs> stand in the way of a good story? So anyway, so there's elements of truth in my family situation, but Beatrice Lily saves me. 
Oh, anyway, it, it's evolving, and now um, I'm calling it there are fairies at the bottom of our garden, and uh, um, it, based on a song that she wrote. And uh, actually, when I was in uh, Scotland just recently, we stopped at a fairy glen. They have a fairy glen yep. over there, and that was really inspiring. I remember uh, nobody was around. I remember singing that there are fairies at the bottom of our garden in the fairy glen. And I don't know, just... I. I kind of kind of go where my creative muse leads me. I go when I did that. I go okay. That's where that my show's going. So so, anyways, um, I love to be creative. A lot of times, I, I like last night. I had such a hard time sleeping because blah, blah 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 blah. You know, the, the brain starts spinning. I just sometimes need to learn to. I, I need to channel it. If I don't yeah. channel it, then it kind of gets blah, 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 blah. so. I'm, thankfully, I have a place to channel it right now. And John, the Adam Driver question that we always ask people, which is, do you find it hard to watch your own performances back? Oh, well, that's very interesting. You know, when I did this panel, um, uh, I, I, I actually taught a workshop last year at this little university, uh, uh, you know, basically self-taping for actors, because that's all the, all the auditioning now is done through self-taping. So you have to videotape yourself. Is that the expression we use anymore? Since there's no video involved, but anyways, we tape ourselves and we. Oh, we've we we've aged ourselves. We've done it. We've done it yet again. We've aged ourselves with videotape. Uh, no. <laughs> Why, John? Why did you need to do it? You had to bring up videotape, which nobody has anymore. Yeah, I know. Well, what do we call it? We we tape ourselves. Right? Record. Record. We record <laughs> ourselves. Okay. We, digit we digitally record ourselves. There we go. There we are. And then we submit. So, anyways, long story short, um, I encourage these uh kids uh for actors and performance types um that are creating their own self-scripted work to videotape themselves and look at themselves. You know, to take a take a little breather, then come back. You know, we're actors. You think of yourself as a, a third party observer looking at yourself. I have learned so much as much as I complained about these self-tapes, you know because you have to be your own lighting designer, your own, you know, yeah. your editor, your sound recorder, you know, all that jazz. It's just been so helpful for me as an actor and a, a writer performer to look at myself on, on screen and go, oh, okay, slow down. I tend to talk really fast, you know. Oh, let, let, let that moment land, um, you know, you know, keep, you know, I, one great thing I learned from uh, doing some of the Star Trek roles, I remember one of the directors, especially in you know, all these big eyeball, uh, you know, because it's all about the eyes with the big contacts. He says, always keep your chin down so your eyes stay open. Because I used to, especially since I play all these haughty characters, you know, you want to <laughs> no, you keep the chin down so the eyes open. <laughs> But I find that's true for all my acting too, because the eyes, the eyes have it, so to speak. But um, it, long story short, I, I would recommend if people can stomach it to look at themselves, it can actually be a very valuable tool, um, you know, especially self tapes, you know, you do it over and over and over and uh, yeah. I can see the mistakes I made and then, uh, you know, try to keep it fresh, but not to repeat some of the, the bad behavior choices. And when you're doing these acting lessons and things like this, John, what are the kind of the main bits of advice that you give to young aspiring actors? Well, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, these very intimate, you know, close up shots we're doing for self tapes, you know, it's all about your partner, you know, like, you know, I say, oh, it's great to look at yourself afterwards. But no, because it, it, when we're acting, it's all about for me, keeping it's engaged with my partner. It's all about trying to get something from them or, you know, make them act a certain way or to change them. So I, that's my biggest thing, you know, like, what are you fighting for in this scene? You know, and then what, what are your obstacles and, and what are the, the contradictions and the, the, you know, the opposites that can make this character interesting? Cause you know, we're not all just, you know, black and white. There's a lot of, um, you know, um, colors in there and shades of gray and, and, and don't be afraid to, I say always have a moment of, you know, silence. One, one great thing, you know, about doing these self tapes, I always wanted to memorize, you know, the script. I like to be on book, book, but it's so much easier, you know, if I can 
kind of frame the, the shot like here, like, so like I'm looking at myself right now, and have the script here. And, and just to know the lines that I need to really nail my character here, you know, just so, so it's, in, but you know, we don't always talk nonstop. A lot of times, you know, you gotta think about what you're gonna say. So it's a great opportunity to look down at your script and oh, and then you pick up, you know, so uh, it can actually work in your face. Use the negative space wisely. Yeah. Mike, very well said. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it embellish that negative space. It's not all positive, active, you know. We we receive too. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, John, have you ever had a situation where you on when you were in the theater, when you were on stage and you forgot a line? Oh yes. Well, actually, uh, in terms of my own self-scripted work, uh, that has happened. And now most of the time in my work, I, I incorporate incorporate that somewhere in the piece. Not that it's like, you know, you, oh, that's he does that in every show, but it can work like a couple of times, like, where am I? And, and like an audience, like, whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, line, and nobody knows you're going to say that. Uh, anyway, but, you know, blah, 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 blah. and it, anyways, that can kill a couple minutes, you know, and uh, and it kind of brings up an audience uh, into you, like, whoa, I don't know where the fuck I am, but uh, I could get out of it, you know, and who knows where I'll come out. Um, but in terms of on on stage, like in a theater piece. Uh, in somebody else's play. Um, God, have I ever uh, forgotten myself? God, I can't remember that, honestly. You know, and then, you know, TV, film, you know, if you forget, you know, God, then you just do it again. You know? Yeah. What do you find is, especially in your performance art, especially in the theater and things like that, what do you make of, say, the connection between you and the audience? What do you look for from them? Like, are you trying to kind of get a connection with them or are you just trying to drown it all out and just say, just going to focus on what's up here? Huh. Well, I like to play with both that, that elements. Like, you know, okay, like just, you know, to suck them into the story, the presentation. But then I, I always like to break the fourth wall uh, and kind of deal directly with them, you know. Um, sometimes even when I'm doing my own work, I like to start in the audience just to, you know, because there's that, that thing that a lot of actors, I don't want to know who's in the audience. Don't tell me who's in the audience. But for me, I find it rather liberating to know friends, enemies. I don't know, just kind of just to get it all out of the way. And OK, I know you're there and I'm not trying to hide from you. And uh, I can now a, slag you off on stage. Yeah. <laughs> I, wait, now, what did you say? I can now what you off? So I can now slag you off on stage. Oh, oh I thought you said something really <laughs> filthy. <laughs> No. This Jeez, is a fam this is a family of... podcast, John. We never say such a thing on this at all. Black you up. Right. Um <laughs> anybody can pull in a theater piece. I mean you, you know the uh, you know, and you're a character, you know, you you're not breaking the fourth wall, but we all know there's an audience out there and you know they're gonna laugh or react. So you, you know. That's why we love theater, because of the live audience. You don't know what will happen. In my own work, I love it when mistakes happen. Like, you know, when, in my more controversial days as a performance artist, oh, I, I'd often have times where people would storm out and go, you know, you're crazy, you know? And and, and you learn, and I go, of course I'm crazy. I'm, I'm trying to do, you know, <laughs> theater in Los Angeles. you got to be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Why bother? Of course, I'm crazy. I'm an actor. <laughs> so, John, what is the story of the NEA4? Ah, the NEA4. Well, the NEA is the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, a big funding source here in, in, in the States. And uh, anyways, in 19, by 1989, uh, fellow performance artist told me, uh, he said, oh, you should apply for an NEA grant. I've never applied really for funding. You know, it was just a scrappy, pretty much clubs, very small theater performer. Anyway, so I applied for this NEA grant for a show I was working on called Blessed Are All the Little Fishes. And uh, and bada bing, I, I got it. You're like, wow, you know. Um, and uh, so I was, uh, so anyways, um, I was one afternoon in 1990, I was doing a, a show at an AIDS hospice here in LA. I actually um, received a little 
city funding to perform there, which was kind of a nightmare. But anyways, I came home and uh, I had like, speaking of, I got to get rid of my landline. Do you guys have landlines still or did you get your one? <laughs> Long gone now at this point. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, old habits. I kind of, I don't answer it. It's all scam. I, so anyways. Uh, but that's so hang on that, a second. You mean the to... scam person who tried ringing your mobile phone is now ringing the landline yeah, as well? They're, they're they're... to get me. Just, See, do you know what I used to do? Every time I used to, because I was in the same boat. No one knew my landline. And yeah. it'll ring and I go, hello, you for Janae Adult Fire here, dear. And just go and just take them for a ride for as long <laughs> as I possibly can. Really? <laughs> you know, maybe I should do that instead of like. It'd be uh, great. You'd be like, yes, there's a problem with your computer. Oh, dear, that's terrible. <laughs> Just really take them for a ride. It's brilliant. <laughs> you know, that might be fun. I'm going to try that. God. Uh, but anyways, back to the uh, NEA thing. So I, I came home from doing the show at the AIDS hospice, and, and I had like 35 uh, voice messages on my old answering machine. You know, back in the day, we had answering machines. And it's like from CNN and da da da, da. What's your reaction to, you know, Senator Jesse Helms saying that you're obscene and perverted? And and then they, they had taken, they had rescinded our grants. We, I never heard of this. It was only through my, the messages on the machine. And so uh, we had received the funding. They didn't tell us that they had pulled the funding, but the, the, they, they did. And the news broke fast, but a, a, a few conservative lawmakers uh, like Senator Jesse Helms from North Carolina and uh, Dana Warbacher here in California, Orange County, um, they uh, objected to the content of these four performance artists uh, at the NEA4, as we ended up being called. And they labeled us obscene and, you know, disgusting, perverted. And it was Karen Finley because she smeared chocolate over her naked body and uh and, and then there were three gay performance artists me being one of them and uh anyway so uh yeah so um yeah it kind of got ugly and uh the, we went to the supreme court we had um lawyers who jumped right in and uh we went to the supreme court and actually the supreme court ruled in our favor you cannot apply standards of morality on art i mean who's the uh you know who's going to decide what's moral and what isn't. And uh, so he won. But then uh, President Clinton, Bill Clinton at the time, threw a little red meat to the uh, to the conservatives and uh, he appealed that decision. So basically the NEA said uh, they could impose standards of morality. And God, I feel bad. Uh, I got funded under um, um, in this under new genre. So after that, they deleted new genre, you know, from their funding categories. But we received our grants and, uh, you know, most of the money went to the attorneys. But hey, well, you know, and but hey, you know, no publicity is bad publicity, as bad as it was, you know, because we spent all our time, you know, we're not, you know, we're morally concerned artists. And yes, we do use extreme forms of body, you know, but it's it, with a higher purpose and a higher story, you know, yeah. it was the 80s, you know, we, we all were using our bodies in, in, in these kind of ways. And uh, so, but like I said, there's no such thing as bad press because that's when I started getting interest from casting directors. You know, they start bringing me in and I actually managed to get an agent. Um, and, uh, you know, and the casting people, you know, because the thing that got me in trouble was I peed on stage while reading a Bible. Okay. <laughs> so just, I mean, <laughs> so, you know, and they loved that. Oh, John Fleck, the, the man who urinates on stage. Or John like the, the man who masturbates on stage. I never masturbated on stage, but anyways, I, I used to like split myself into male, female, and just be aggressive, and I kind of rape myself metaphorically. Anyways, I did not masturbate, <laughs> but I did. I did pee on stage, but you know, <laughs> there's a bigger picture to it besides the shocking element. But hey, you got to give the old guy credit. I could pee on cue. Not everybody can do that. You try it. You try it right now. Come on, Mike. I want to see you do it. Uh, uh, no, no, Mike, I'm only kidding. He's peeing right now. Oh, Jesus. Uh, but anyways, back to there's no no press, uh, bad press. And, uh, so I, they started calling me in and, you know, the, you know, 
then they'd finally get over, you know, don't pee on the furniture. But anyways, I started working. And then the Star Trek stuff started to happen in the early 90s. And I, they liked me. I'm Star Trek, David Livingston. I remember him. He was one of the directors. And he'd call me in to play all these different characters. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and that's when Murder One happened because they were reading about me. And, you know, so, you know... I, any press is good press. Your name's out there. And uh, yep. and I had some talent, so I started working. So I was very thankful. Thank you and for that. And during your career then, like, so who were some of the kind of the performers that you would have looked up to, that you would have admired, that you would have said, I want to kind of be like them? Or was there anyone like that? Oh, Jesus. Oh, God. Well, we, you, know. we, you come here, John, for the hard questions. We tell you the hard questions. You tell us about urinating on stage while reading the Bible. It's a fair trade, I think. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, back to that image, that hor horrible image, because I know the, the Bible is a sacred book, but I was trying to kind of play with the philosophy, you know, President Harry S. Truman once said, you know, one man's profanity is another man's philosophy. So I was trying to, you know, as this man's reading, he's overcome, like a miracle happens and, and he, it's like a golden shower appears, so to speak. And he reaches down into the toilet bowl and a, and a goldfish is there. And I don't know, I, I was playing with, you know, how do we define a, a, a miracle, you know, so that's what I was playing with you know I was a punk rocker what can I say you know it was all about shocking people so um but uh who were some of the people that I looked up to well it's changed over the years I mean you know I mean I mean Tim Curry he was a big you know I mean got it back in the 80s you know the Rocky Horror Picture Show um god I just who, who really Tim I, Curry is consistently brilliant and no matter what he's in like no matter yeah. like I was watching TV on the weekend and he was in Loaded Weapon 1 with Emilio Estevez and Samuel L. Jackson. He's just brilliant. He's not he's not in a whole lot of scenes, but any scene he's in, he's just magnificent. And, uh, I, I guess, you know, I just asked somebody about him the other night. What happened to Tim? Whatever happened to Tim Curry? That's that song from um, Rocky Horror Picture Show. So whatever happened to something. But anyways, I, I guess he had, he had a stroke or something. Have you heard that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's, 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 so, yeah. he's having a hard time. So I, I wish him well. He's a very talented man. Um, but who are my other uh, poems? God, there's so many good actors. I mean, right now, you know, we just watch poor things. You know, Mark Ruffalo, he, he's so, God, I just... I remember seeing him on stage here in LA, God, back in the 80s, you know, even a little, little off, 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 you know, like 30 seat theater, you know. So, hey, it's nice when you see actors, you know, um, making it, so to speak. So, uh, I don't know. Actually, I just, like, should, just on that, John, outside of Mark Ruffalo, you saw him on stage. Was there any other actors you saw on kind of stage at the start of their career who got onto much bigger things? What oh, Jesus, it's gone to much bigger things. Wow. Again, I'm really testing your memory, John, here, to be honest wow. with you. Every question is kind of drawing it all back. Right. Well, I'm just trying to think. Um, you know, a lot of my actor buddies are still doing TV and film, but did anybody become a, like a really big um, star? Uh, no. I can't, you know, I'm sorry. I'm just. Having a blank on that. Uh, you don't need to apologize, John. We did land this question on you. Out of, absolutely. Well, it's in here. It'll pop out randomly. <laughs> okay. I get a phone call at three o'clock in the morning that'll say scam likely and it'll be John on the other end of the phone. <laughs> Hang on a second. I've got the answer right here. Let me tell you who it is. So, what time is it there now? You're eight hours ahead of us. So it's like uh, seven. It's just gone three seven, past eight. seven. Yeah. Okay. Or 1900. Yes. 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 <laughs> um, John, in terms of say outside of obviously Star Trek, what are some of the other roles that you've really enjoyed doing over the years? I know we before we started the podcast, we discussed Murder One, which you did enjoy, and obviously as well Carnival as well. I'm guessing would be on the list. Uh, you know Carnival. You know, I I think I got into TV film because. I wanted to make a living. So for me, you know, it. I love how handsomely they pay you, you know. Uh, a Carnival, uh, you know, I, it was a series regular, which is, you know, looks good on the, you know, IMDb, you know, series yeah. regular. But it was, I mean, it was 
that I called it torture pay because I had all that makeup, you know, I, I'd have to oftentimes show up at three in the morning, you know, for like a four hour makeup job so I could be ready by 7 a.m., you know, so uh, and that was, you know, I wrote a piece about that, you, you know, they, they if you had to, I just had to do it a couple of times, full body, you know, prosthetics and they glue it all over you. You know, it's not just makeup, it's prosthetics, you yeah. know, very thin. Uh, so, uh, you know, so you lay, you know, they, they put you in a little thong, you know, and they're, they're, you know, they're gluing you at four in the morning and then five in the morning. Then they, then they flip you over and you almost feel like a rotisserie chicken, you know, it's like they're, they're like basting you and and you know and you, and you know your ass is in their face pretty much you know and they're gluing stuff on your oh my god but anyways hey i made a, a whole bunch of overtime and a series regular pay so thank you thank you um the only problem with playing these non-human well gecko was human he just had a you know a, a skin condition but but it was during that time i was also finishing up my last episode of um star trek enterprise so I would go, you know, in, in, in between shooting on Carnival and all this makeup, I would be shooting uh, Enterprise with all this makeup. And the killer thing about these roles is it's the removal of the, the, the these pieces. It takes a lot of time. And, and it almost, you know, it, it, you feel like your skin is being pulled off at the, at the end of the day. And they're, oh, you know, just be gentle, guys. And my skin was getting so dry and so damaged. So I learned a lot about um, skincare products during this time period, you know. But back to what I was saying, you know, I got a little typecast as the uh, the makeup man, you know, almost like Doug Jones, that actor who does a lot of the, uh, you know, stuff. You know, you get typecast. And, uh, you know, I made a you know, joke out of, you know, I, I don't play human beings anymore. You know, I play, I play these creatures. But... But hey, once again, the, they pay very well and the residuals are very nice, especially for the Star Trek roles that keep rolling in. So uh, so in terms of what roles did I really enjoy? Oh, I mean, I enjoyed them. You know, I just finished up on Orville, you know, before they canceled it. Was this going to be another question or am I, am I jumping ahead? No, no, you're fine. Oh. You're absolutely fine. Yeah, work away. Oh, OK. But once again, it was, was a lot of makeup. And, and very financially rewarding. But, but I mean, is it, are they a lot of fun? Ah. <laughs> Nobody knows who you are. I mean, one hand, you know, you don't have to worry about shaving or showering or anything because, you know, you're under all this makeup. But, you know, as an actor, nobody knows who you are, you know, when you're out of the makeup, you know. So um, that's humbling. But in terms of my favorite roles, I, you know, geez, I mean, this role I did last year, you know, God, that was so complex and human. I love that. And, uh, you know, I, I've done a lot of little movies along the way that I really enjoyed. I just like to act and have some meat to chew on, you know, and have some really back good back and forth with other actors so yeah and what are some of the roles that kind of you feel challenge you best then these kind of situations oh geez was it well i mean not to keep bringing up this little movie dead nail uh that i'm going to south by southwest that that was really challenging somebody a, a very sweet reclusive man who ends up being a killer you know but but it's all about him trying to survive I, don't, I, I always try to make everything I do. I, I really try to make it whole and, and as um, meaningful for me and, and hopefully for the watcher as possible to see a complex, you know, person or even, you know, as a, a an alien, a monster, how, how how human can I make these, you know, monsters, so to speak. So that that's always rewarding when I can do that. Um, you know, I just love to act. So, hey, you know, I'm a, I'm available and I hope you guys have a film job you can offer me soon. That's why I'm doing this, you know. <laughs> yeah, clone star of the movie. It's coming out in 2030, yeah? 2030. <laughs> oh boy, you better hurry. I ain't, I ain't getting any younger. <laughs> um, John, one thing is that I noticed you were in Waterworld. Yes. How much of a troubled production was it, as we're always led to believe that it was disastrous? You know the biggest flop of all time. I actually think it's turned a profit. I think you know over the years it's kind of uh, legendary. Well, you know what? Hey, um, 
I, God, I remember I was uh, um, with my former partner back in the day, uh, like around 90, uh, when was it, 94? And I auditioned for this um, water world. I met Kevin um, Reynolds, I think the director was. Just charming. Um, Costner. Uh, but the 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 um the director um a friend of it wasn't his name Kevin as well I can't remember I thought but, he direct, uh, I thought Costner directed this I could be wrong no no Costner didn't direct it no um oh. yeah it was a friend of his and uh, I know I think after the movie was they, they Kevin were Reynolds Kevin Reynolds. Reynolds thank you thank you uh, anyway so I auditioned and God, a month went by and, and you know you just okay next you know you forget about it anyway they get a call from my agent okay they want you in Hawaii tomorrow okay what yeah tomorrow so pack up uh, so I packed up and uh, went there and anyways I ended up being there for almost four months and I only worked one day that uh, so you know in terms of their their uh, they just didn't know what they were freaking doing it was a big set and they built all these things out in the water you know in uh, in hawaii on the big island there and i was referred to i was a cover set you know if, if the bad weather came out they couldn't shoot out there they'd come shoot interiors with me and anyways they had really great weather and they ended up they couldn't use any of the stuff they shot out there but they never used me so they kept me in hawaii for four months which was just glorious you know to get a per diem and to to live on the beach and i mean i can place. definitely think of worse places to be oh. stuck at for four months <laughs> well you know jack black uh, he actually jack black that's a, a guy that's always inspired me we've known each other um God, from the 80s, when he was uh, a, a young wee lad in um, Actors Gang, uh, a theater company out here in LA, talented kid. Anyways, Jack Black um, flew to, uh, he, once again, he got that call. You gotta be in Hawaii, you know, tomorrow, you know, not the same time as me. He was playing some kind of airplane pilot, a small role, but he ended up being there for almost three and a half weeks, you know, and all he did was bring a toothbrush. So he had to buy all these clothes and everything, but, uh, but yeah, it was pretty uh, disorganized. So we came back to LA and they built all the set, interior sets that they, they had built in Hawaii. They, they shot them here and everything we shot was on a green screen. So, you know, the ocean's behind us, but, the, but we, we shot it in front of a green screen. So I ended up working about six months on it and, uh, you know, made a, a lot of ka-ching, a lot of, a lot of dough and, uh, you know. Did you, get a good, did, did you get a good tan when you were over in Hawaii? Ah, you know, I'm not a tanner. I, I stay out of the sun, but uh, but uh, I swam with the turtles and uh, had a lot of friends visit me. It was just a, a glorious, glorious time, you know. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I met Bob Joy, uh, Robert Joy. Uh, uh, he's a friend, and he's he's actually doing a lot of TV work these days. And, uh, and there was a, an English actor named Gerard Murphy. Was that his name? Anyways, he he was great and. Actually, when I went to London, uh, I visited London in 1995, and it was the uh, when Murder One was released. I remember uh, all that. I, I and the English were so kind. God, they treated me like a star. You know, it was just a tiny role, but they people love Murder One uh, over in England. You know, but I, I had lunch with Gerard Murphy, but I think he's died since uh, since then. We lost contact. So, but anyways, yes, it was a rather disarray. But I think Waterworld ended up making. Um, being profitable, you know. So, Finch at okay. some point. Um, John, just in terms of Star Trek, did you grow up being a fan of Star Trek or when outside of, say, acting in it or how did your knowledge of it come about? Yeah, you know, um, I, I was never, you know, I remember watching the original uh, Star Trek with William Shatner, but not, you know, I was not a zealot, you know, just if, if it was there, I watched it, but I, I didn't see every episode and, uh, so no, I, I wasn't, and, and you know, I was so, God, you know, when I started doing all these Star Treks, I never watched any of them that I did. Isn't that something? Well, we didn't have cable back then for one thing, you know, and I don't know, I, I guess perhaps I could have been more successful in the TV world if I had perhaps treated it with a little bit more respect. I just considered it a day job, you know, did it, done, moving on, you know. No. So, so hang on a second. In the twelve episodes of Star Trek, then you've been in. Have you ever actually watched them back? Oh, um, so over over the years, especially uh, I just uh, 
decided, well, maybe I should make a sci-fi reel. I have an acting reel on my IMDb page. Yeah. Maybe I should make a sci-fi reel. So I have been, you know, especially with, you know, digitalization here, I can, you know, you can see anything and everything. Uh, so I have been watching them. And once again, my, my advice to young actors or old actors or any actors, uh, it's helpful to watch yourself after you do it. Cause, cause like I, I was watching Star Trek Enterprise trying to find a scene from there to choose. And my posture was so bad. I go, oh my God, uh, I, I have a beer belly in one of the scenes. Aliens don't have beer bellies. And I go, you know, had I seen myself, I could have corrected my posture a little bit more, you know? But oh, So looking but... back at it now, would you do anything differently? Oh, geez. Well, how would I do? Like, what do you mean? Do it in terms so, of. Um, would you approach any of the Star Trek roles that you've done differently? Would you have done something different with the character, or? Well, you know, had I had I chosen a, a different approach, they might not not have cast me. So I, I you know, I, I obviously what I gave them is what they wanted, and then you know, you take direction and you know, tweak it along the way. Um, what would I? I've done, I don't know, acting wise, I, I think I nailed most of it, but maybe some technical things. I mean, I'm so grateful for that one director that said, you know, keep your chin down, show those eyes, you know, you're torturing yourself with those giant contacts. God, I hate contacts, you know, I, I don't wear them. And to have these giant things put in is truly torturous. Um, so uh, I, I really can't think of anything that I do differently from an acting interview just maybe technically you know stuff like that mm, yeah so so in terms of how it all came about was it because of the controversy with the dea or the nea4 or yeah. was it <laughs> the, the, DOA4. Okay. <laughs> uh, the doa4 I, are you saying what was the, were they connected like the press from that? It, 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 to, yeah, is that like, do you think that's how what, what brought say you to the attention of the Star Trek producers? Because obviously, look, you know, the roles you've done, like starting out with the next generations, the mind's eye, and all that. Right. Like you play a very kind of you have the height, you have the prominence, you're imposing, you've got this wonderfully like villainous voice. And I know you, Jan, it's a lovely voice you have. But when you're in Star Trek, it's a very villainous voice you have, especially for the Romulan that you played and the Cardassian in DS9 and things like that. But do you think, like, was it your acting or was it that controversy that brought you to their attention, do you think? Or could it be a mixture of both? I think it's probably a mixture of both, maybe, you know. Um, you know, yes, that happened. And then uh, I just happened to get a, a, a decent agent, you know, that, that time period. So they were submitting me. And... Uh, and maybe because he knew of my background, he started submitting me for the Star Trek roles, you know, for yeah. these alien monster creatures. And maybe that did have something to do. But, you know, a lot of people, you know, they 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 remember your name, but they don't know in what context, you know. And especially back then, they did, we didn't have computers like, oh, Google, you know. John yeah, it's not like you could just Google someone to figure out who they are. Right. Look, right. I, just, I, I have to say this. This is like the fourth time we've aged ourselves in the podcast. <laughs> right? We've had VHS tips. We've had answering machines. We've now got, you couldn't Google yourself back in the day. Uh, we didn't have basic cable. So we've gone to four levels at this point. Before the podcast started, we did another one. So that's actually five times we've engaged ourselves <laughs> in this <Really>? conversation. <laughs> yes. Well, when, when you're, you know, when your career spans like 45 years, hello, it is a history <laughs> of our technological innovation here. Wow. So, so of all the roles then, John, which is the worst one for makeup then? Because you played two Romulans, you played a Cardassian, you've played a cheaters above. I can barely read this as a caraman, a caraman. Uh, you played someone oh, in Voyager. Caraman. There's no uh race. So which was the worst makeup to get on? I'm assuming it's Silic, but I could be wrong. Uh, I think you're wrong there. Um uh, the worst in terms of the laborious process, probably yeah. like I said, gecko. They didn't do that many full bodies, but uh it, that could be a five-hour makeup job, just into it, and then another two to three hours to get out of it. Uh, but I do remember one a horrible afternoon. Oh god, um God, I'm trying to it was a deep space nine, but we they cast me as this character and I think it begins with a C, not a Kardashian. When I say Kardashian, I keep thinking of Kim Kardashian. Is is that how we say Kardashian? 
that, that don't well, there's there's plenty no of hate. out there yeah. <laughs> um i think it was in the search part one john i think yeah, Cara, caraman yeah okay well, anyways, I had to shoot it outside, and and it was, all, and it was like we shot it like on location, which they usually did, but it was like out in the desert somewhere. And it was like 120 degrees, and all this makeup, and you're sweating in your eyes. You get these contacts, and there's salt in your eyes. Oh, and I couldn't see where I was going, and I kept tripping. And I, I remember Nana, Nana Visitor, was that? Who is that? Yeah. 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 Yes. Oh, I'm. Mean, she, God bless her. She tried so hard not to keep laughing, but I kept like <laughs> falling over rocks and, uh, you know, take after take and the sweat dripping inside. So that was probably the worst one. But um, uh, <laughs> go on. And what was it like working on the sets? Like you've obviously been on TNG, DS9, Voyager, and Enterprise. Which one, kind of like in terms of say the actors that you kind of uh, worked with, like who were the kind of well, I, I, I'm not going to say who was the nicest, who wasn't nice. Like, who were the kind of the actors you kind of got on with when you were there? Well, I got to say Scott Bakula in Enterprise, because I did so many more episodes. So you establish a relationship. Yeah. Uh, uh, he was just just the nicest, um, kindest man, you know. I, a real, And, you know, because he started in the theater, I do find actors who come from theater tend to be the nicest ones. Actors, uh, and I don't want to just, you know you know, categorize and make a cliche out of it. But I, I do find actors who came from theater tend to be a little bit more personable. A lot of just TV film actors just, you know, show up, you know, you know, do your lines, get out, you know, and they barely look at you, you know. So um, so I appreciate the humanity when somebody's nice to me and responds in a kind way. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, Scott Bakula really stands out. Um, I remember LeVar Burton, that was like my first mind's eye, a very nice guy, you know, um, kind to me. You know, if you're kind to me and, you know, because a lot of us guest star actors, you know, we're just little, you know, tools, you know, in the, in, you know, the great hog, the machine, you know, so in, out, in, out. So, <clears throat> you know, a lot, of, a lot of people, stars don't really have much to say to you. So, but for the most part, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and everybody was really, really nice to me. I can't think of anybody who wasn't nice to me on Star Trek. And what were some of your good memories of working on Star Trek in over the years? Oh, some of my good memories. Jesus. Um, well, getting the make off uh, off at the end of the day, that was always <laughs> a good memory. Um, I learned uh, meditation. I really learned to really meditate very deeply because, you know, most of the time when you're doing these things, you're in your trailer waiting to work you know it's yeah. you know you spend hours and, and when you <clears throat> i remember one time <clears throat> excuse me i think i need some water and choke you're fine here. Take okay. it's right here um i remember I, uh, excuse me i was working as silic on enterprise and you know between the makeup and these costumes they're skin tight you know I mean, you can't even go to the bathroom without someone's assistance, uh, assistance unzipping you, you know, to get out of your costume. It's very humbling. So, but I remember one time laying in the, my trailer and I started to panic, you know, it's just, you got these contacts and, and you, you just feel like you've been embalmed, you know, you, you can't breathe because you got all these girdles on. And one of the things when you play these aliens, you cannot have any um, genitalia bulge, you know, there are no penises, no genitalia in outer space. So they, so they kind of pretty much like, you know, <clears throat> scrunch everything down with these girdles and stuff. So uncomfortable. Anyway, I'm starting to have a panic attack. Oh, I can't breathe. So I just, <clears throat> thank God I, I studied transcendental meditation back in the day, but I had forgotten about it, but it really got me in touch with, you know, breathing in and breathing out and whoo, just, you know, relaxing and letting go and whoo, getting out of here and just, uh, so that kind of, I mean, <laughs> it's, it has nothing to do with the acting, but I'm so thankful uh, it, it uh, got me in touch with, um, meditation again and uh and um that is kind of one of the things about acting relaxation you got to be relaxed you gotta kind of be present you can't be up in your head you can't be you know panicking and oh, i'm gonna die you know so um but but in terms of the acting roles and all the star trek god i remember one i don't even know what show it was on um i i played a courtroom and i i had 
big monologues. And I was a little scared that day, but damn it, I did it. It was very Shakespearean. That's what I find about a lot of these roles and why a lot of actors can't, can't do it because it is very specific um, form of communicating and language. It's almost Shakespearean in a way. You know, there's a mm. lot of, you have to be very precise and, you know, there's a lot of technical uh, te technical jargon and, you, you know, it has to roll trippingly off your tongue. I remember auditioning for, um, uh, in the room, uh, for um, Silic on Star Trek, you know, you go in, it's at Paramount and, oh, there's Rick Berman, the creator and all the directors and writers and producers. It can be a little nerve wracking, but anyways, uh, I did it and, I, and I'm doing this long monologue and then I, I think I had a line but, and, I, and, and I said, and I'm gonna, and, I, and I'm gonna go, okay, let's keep the camera rolling. We don't say gonna in outer space. So I went back and I said that line, I've got to. And you know what? I think that's what booked it for me. They appreciated that spontaneous. And that's one of the things about these whole self-tape things. You don't they, you don't go in offices anymore. There, there's no one-on-one -on -one communication. And I swear, I worked a lot more and a lot of actors feel this. You go in, you can charm an, or you can charm an audience. And, and if you make a mistake, that's the thing. I, I love mistakes because you can kind of correct it on your feet. You don't stop the scene. You keep going. And it just, you know, and then they can give you an adjustment, you know. And, you know, back in the day, you know, maybe there'd be eight to ten, you know, other actors out for the same role. Now you've got, you know, up to 300 self-tapes coming into these casting offices. And a lot of the assistants, they don't know who us old timers are anymore. You know, they, they look at you for five seconds now, you know, next, next, next. So there's not, we don't have that human contact anymore. So I don't know. But on the other hand, I love self-taping. I don't have to leave home. I can do it as many times as I want. And it's kind of like a master class in, you know, film acting in a way. So And if the have. offer if the offer came around, John, because obviously there's so many new Star Trek shows at the moment, if you had the offer to go back and do it again, be it in an animated one, just with a voiceover, or go back onto one of the live action ones, would you do it? In a heartbeat. Oh, yes, I would. I I I actually I I I see that's another thing. A lot of actors can't do that, you know, makeup stuff because it, it can drive you insane. I'm okay with it, you know. I can, I can turn it off and just just go into hibernation, when, you know, on a on a set, and uh, you know, and then you know, into the deep freeze, and then you come out and act. But I, I, I enjoy it, you know. I'm working on the Orville, you know. I did three episodes with Seth uh, MacFarlane. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, talk about a nice man, mm, Seth MacFarlane. I like him very much. Uh, very kind and respectful, and, and he works with you. He's very creative. You know, like try this, try this, try that. Um, so, uh, and of course, Seth was on Enterprise as well himself in yeah. two episodes. Oh, he was. Why didn't I know that? Oh shit, we could have had something to talk about. Oh damn. <laughs> Oh, damn it. He was Ensign Rivers, yeah. He was uh, just briefly in two of them, yeah. Wait, which which Star Trek? Enterprise. Enterprise. I'll be damned. Oh god. Well, maybe that's how I ended up getting the job because he, he knew I was an Enterprise. I don't know. Um, but yes, to answer your question, I I, I would do it. I, I, it's, yeah. And what yeah, was the experience of working was... on the Orville like? Oh, geez, what was that like? Um, well. God, I, I sound so mercenary, but when I talk about these things, eh, it's all about the money, but you know, I gotta say, <laughs> well, the, the, la the last two episodes, it was it was basically, uh, I, I got the, sec uh, the, the third episode in like three days before they shut down the industry when COVID happened. Yeah. So, so we were scheduled to shoot and, you know, it, it just started to bubble up. And anyways, there was all this scheduling brouhaha with Ted Danson. He was in uh, one of the scenes and he's a busy working actor. He's a star, you know? <clears throat> so, so they kept, uh, so they booked me and, and, uh, and then they, they postponed it for a month and then they added another episode and then they, so they shot like the, the, third episode one day and then they took another two week break and we came back and we shot this and they were scrambling to get it on. Anyways, I ended up working like uh, on two episodes, I ended up working like two and a half. It was like a water world basically for me. I made so much money because uh, they have to pay you for every you know week that you, they keep holding you. So 
Oh, but hey, um, uh, but other than that, no, God, I just love being on the set. I, you know, playing aliens or uh, it's just, it, I don't know, it just feels it's fun and you really feel connected. It really is a, you know, they talk about a family, you know, but you are, we're all working together to create this piece. And uh, and I just love, and uh, I mean, the actor Seth was great. I mean, he was busy. He's kind of was directing too, you know, as well as acting. And I was so disappointed that they, uh, they, I think it might have had more of a life in terms of another season if the uh, pandemic hadn't come along. I think mm -hmm. that took a lot of steam out of the out of the show, and they they canceled it. But you know, I was set up to come back again, and I, I was really looking forward to that, but it never happened. So. And, J and John, from what you're saying as well is um, you're also advising our audience the best thing to do to support you is to re-watch all those episodes of Star Trek that you were in on repeat because it'll build up the residuals that you get oh. as a result. Is that correct? Yes, I'm counting on you, show. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Is that how it works? Is that how it works? I don't know. Huh. I do not know, but look, we'll we'll find out by trying it and just see the Paramount okay. suddenly notice. Wait a second, John Flex episodes are doing really good here at the moment. Maybe we need to bring that man back. Ah, there you have it. That's how it works, right? <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I'm going to leave the last question to you. Oh, you're leaving the last one to me. Okay. Yeah. John, this is a really easy question. You won't have to think about it at all. Okay. John Fleck, what does Star Trek mean to you? Stop saying, what does that mean to me? Ah, uh, well, that means, ooh, it's a legacy. It, um, um, a, 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 a skill that I, not that I didn't perfect, but that I, that I could do well. Um, and what, I guess legacy, people remember Star Trek, and I'm so thankful I'm, I'm here with you guys because, you know, it lives on. So, um, I don't know, possibilities. I love the, that's why, I, you know, for me, the whole sci-fi world, just the imagination gets to run rampant. What if there were other worlds out there? I don't know. Um, did I answer your question? Perfect. You okay. absolutely did, yes. <laughs> uh, oh, my hands are alive. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Mike, I'll let you do the wrap up as well. You want to do the wrap up as well? Okay, fine. I always get the wrap up for some reason. <laughs> you're a practice hand at a mic. You're, you're, oh, you're, okay. you're, fine. you're a good rapper. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for tuning into this week's episode of The War Room. My co-host, the wonderful Joseph Hurley, and myself. Uh, if you'd like to catch up with more Clone Star podcasts, make sure you check out our website, clonestarpod.com, for incredible merch, as well as blogs and fan art written by you, our fans. Until next time, live long and prosper.